Mm, I don't have that. Hello there. Good morning. Hey, Will. Hey, Tracy. Hey, Tracy. Hi, Eric. How are you? Yeah. How's life in Winona? It's great. Wonderful. Back to our prior to pandemic in person classes. Um, all events are back to normal homecoming. I mean, as of right now, you know how that goes. Things could change at any given time, but we're doing good. Things are great. Yeah, that's awesome. Good for you. We might be, uh, my, my wife might be coming down on Saturday. We're going to take a little road oh, trip. Oh, awesome. We have a football game that day, too. So oh, is it really? Oh, okay. Yeah, so the oh. game day, the pre-tailgate stuff is from 11 to 1. Oh, okay. On Johnson Street, so check that out. Maybe we will. Perfect. I didn't, know, I didn't even know that, so that's awesome. So I take a sip of water and then Mr. Hansen takes a sip of water, or maybe it's gin. What's that? So I, I take a sip of water and then Mr. Hansen takes a sip of water, or maybe it's gin. You, pro you prompted me. No, it's not gin. Not this early. <laughs>
All right, hey everyone, I'm, I'm just gonna wait a few more minutes. Um, give people a few more minutes to join before we get started. But happy Wednesday, happy hump day. Hello, for those just joining, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes and then I'm going to start it because I got a lot of content to go through and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, How to Write Digital Content That Gets Results. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces on the, on the call today. Um, my name is Eric Hansen. 
I am an independent social media and digital marketing consultant. I've been doing that for the last 12 years. I usually work for mid-sized and large companies like Walmart, Walgreens, Toro, General Mills, Dairy Queen, um, companies of that nature. Um, my work usually revolves in three different areas, uh, uh, social media strategy and research, uh, social media and content, or social media coaching and training. I'm also a uh, professor at the University of St. Thomas and the University of Minnesota, where I teach a class on digital marketing and um, social media marketing. I've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, keeps me busy and is a lot of fun, keeps me young. Um, I also write a blog um, that I've written for the last 12 years. Uh, I have over 1,500 blog posts in, in, in the cycle now. Um, Co-host a podcast with my friend J Kevin Hunt from General Mills and write an e-newsletter for people like you to keep you ahead of the curve. If you want to sign up for any of that stuff or subscribe, you can go to erichanson.com. So enough about me. Um, we're here to talk about uh, social media content, digital content, and how you can um, write better content. So a pretty simple agenda today. Um, we're going to talk a lot about social content, just because that's a big area of focus for me and probably where I have the most uh, expertise to lend. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, web content. If you're in the press of revamping your website or maybe thinking about that down the road or or just updating it, um, have some, some tips and, and best practices there. And then finally, we'll wrap up and talk about uh, e-newsletter content at the end. So but let's start first with social. So um, I thought this post was a nice way to start this section um, because this is kind of what we see on in our feeds a lot in social media, right? Like how to write the perfect social media post. I thought this one was perfect, um, no pun intended, but because it's almost like there's a formula, right? Is the sense you get from a lot of people? Like it, there's a formula to produce these things when in reality, there's, there's not. Um, it takes a much more, I think it takes a much more pragmatic approach and that involves asking yourself, I believe four simple questions. Uh, starting with what do the numbers tell you? Right, so I know a lot of us are looking at our analytics and our numbers on a weekly or monthly basis or quarterly basis, or what have you. But, but are you really looking at the numbers um, on an in-depth way? And do you know what's driving engagement, traffic, and leads? Because that's really the metrics we're looking at when you're talking about social content. You're looking at, and maybe you throw reach in there, right? But I would probably love that in with engagement. But these are, these are what you're looking at. So, like, do you know what what which your, which pieces of your content are are driving those leads? Um, and how often are you looking at that content? So, um, and, how and how deep are you diving into the content? So the example I'll give you here is from my, um, my Dairy Queen client, client. So I work with Dairy Queen on employer brand work and specifically LinkedIn at the moment. And um, this is a post we did to celebrate their 81st birthday back in June. And um, you can see we did the, you know, the fancy uh, uh, birthday cake. Um, we did the retro t-shirt. And, um, and there's the post, right? So if you go back to that previous slide, whoops. This, these are the stats in the box there that show you um, the specific stats that around this post. So you can see it did pretty well, right? The reach was high and the impressions, um, had a lot of likes, had a decent amount of comments, and it had a lot of shares, especially compared to um, you know, the last 30 days. So at the time, that was the most of shares of any post we'd had in 30 days. So then you dive deeper into the contact, right? So like, well, why did that happen? Well, we started looking into who exactly shared it and it turns out, not surprisingly, it was a lot of employees, right? So, well, now all of a sudden, we, there was a learning that came out of that, that those, the statistics that showed us that, well, um, maybe that's a lever we can pull in the future, right? Employees are proud of working at Dairy Queen. Anytime we want to play to that employee pride, we want to generate more shares, which would give us more virality with our content. We could, we could pull that lever and we could create content that hits on that um, employee pride. So that's what I mean about diving a little bit deeper into the numbers. Or about content scoring system. I mean, have you thought about that? And some of you might, might do this, but like even like a, a, just a rudimentary content scoring system where you're giving one point for a like, three points for a comment, and five points for a share on a platform like LinkedIn, for example, like here's Dairy Queen again, right? So if I take the birthday post on the right and the left, you have another post that performed quite well for us featuring this woman named Heather who had had this Dairy Queen hat and she was a huge Dairy Queen fan as a kid and then she ended up working for Dairy Queen. She found the same hat. We thought that was kind of a fun post. Allowed us to talk about her story a little bit. But you can see by using the content scoring system allows us to compare us apples to apples, right? And you can see in this case, the Dairy Queen birthday post performed much better from a scoring system. And why? Well, most of the numbers are, are similar except for those shares. 
but the shares are weighted very heavily, right? Because that's what, you know, spreads virality and that's what gets your post a little more attention than the likes are usually the softest of the three metrics that you're looking at. So by giving it that content score, you can say, well, how did this piece of content do versus this piece of content? And that allows you to do that very easily and make content uh, planning decisions based on information. So that might be something to think about. Um, question number two, uh, you know, when one was last time you really asked yourself, which platform are you writing for? And what I mean by that is like, we see so many people um, and so many brands developing content and then merchandising that content across, you know, all channels, right? Um, we've all seen that many times. And, um, and, and some of us are guilty of doing it from time to time too, right? Sometimes you just get stuck in or forced into doing it. There's many reasons that we do it. But do you really know your audiences, what your audiences look like on the platform? That'd be the first question. But then the second question is like, do you know, have you really thought about why people are using these platforms in a while? Because sometimes we get so caught up in our content uh, streams of developing content on a monthly basis. You gotta stop and think about like, why are people using Facebook in 2021, for example, right? Well, based on you know any number of, of data sources you can find on the web, I tend to lean towards pretty reputable sources like Pew Internet or Pew Research Center. But we you know people are using Facebook to search for news. That's not new information. They've been doing that. People have been doing that for years. We know people are connecting with uh, family and friends on Facebook. We know they're going there for entertainment purposes. Okay, well, if that's why people are going there, then wouldn't it make sense to kind of tailor your content a little bit towards, towards those things, right? Just in general, those why people are going to Facebook, right? So what, what would that mean from a company standpoint? Well, it would stand to reason that news and company information would, would resonate with people because they're going there for news. Well, companies generate news all the time. Um, it would stand to reason that you would, you would share interactive, entertaining videos. What about photos with your employees or customers? Like think about the reasons people use the platform. Well, let's repeat the same exercise very quickly with link, LinkedIn. Why are people using LinkedIn in 2021? Well, According to LinkedIn and many other data sources, we know people are really going to LinkedIn for two reasons. They're going there to get smarter about their industry or their jobs, or they're looking for a job. 40 million people are looking for jobs on LinkedIn each week. Okay, so if we know that, um, are we tailoring content, again, a little bit, to why people are using LinkedIn? So what would make sense from a business perspective? Well, industry trends and news, obviously. Tips and best practices that you could offer that would help people in your industry get smarter or maybe even leadership and inspiration. Um, I think about people like, if you follow Sarah Blakely, who's the CEO of Spanx uh, on LinkedIn, like she crushes on LinkedIn, mostly because she's offering up these inspirational posts um, pretty much every day, right? That's part of, the, part, of the, part of the reason why people go to LinkedIn. They wanna be inspired. They wanna do a better job at work. They wanna be the best, be the best day they can be at work. Um, so could you give them some of that content they're looking for when they go to the platform? That's what I'm talking about with that second question. Third question, um, why does your audience, what does your audience actually want? Do you know? A lot of people don't know what their audience wants for them from content because you've never asked them, right? Um, and business communicators are not usually in direct contact with their audiences. Um, you can see from this, this chart here, this, this, this piece of uh, data, that, yeah, we're reviewing our analytics. We talked about that a minute before. We're monitoring social media for what customers are saying. Um, and we might even talk to sales and, and customer support, but we don't conduct surveys with our customers to find out what they want from us in terms of content. We don't make calls to customers. We're not participating in online communities with our audience. So in a lot of cases, we, we don't know as well as we thought we did. Um, now, there are a couple of brands, I think, that are doing a pretty good job here, and Column is definitely one of them. And even you can see right from their, their Facebook header here, like. They get that people come to them because, yeah, they want the app, but they, more importantly, they want to figure out ways to slow down and be more calm and, and, and meditate and, and things of that nature, right? Their content, like on their Facebook content specifically, is just all engineered around that, right? They can talk about the app and how cool the app is and all the features and functionality, just like other people do with their apps. But instead, what you see from them is content that's designed to um, solve the problem that people are looking to solve when they want to app like calm right so the, the piece of content on the left is the timer with the waves crashing and just the visual and the audio of that is supposed to calm you for 30 seconds like instant calm right or the the printable calendars or downloadable calendars they have where they give you tips based on different themes for each month like it's all designed um 
to get at their customer's problem. And, and, and they know that because they know their customers inside and out. What about Dell? Dell is doing, you know, what, again, what an easy thing we could all do. And that's just asking customers questions on, you know, using LinkedIn polling functionality or Twitter polling functionality. So some easy ways that we can get at discovering um, what our audience actually wants from us. I mean, number one, ask them. So we just showed you the Dell, the Dell quote, but like, you know, use that poll functionality on some of the major platforms. That's kind of what it's there for. Um, send them surveys via SurveyMonkey. Um, that could inform your future content decisions. Talk to your sales reps, talk to the customer service teams. Those are the people most close to your customers. And then finally, um, that last idea is something I've thought about in the past, but I've never really implemented it with a client, but just kind of looking for the right opportunity because I think it's a great idea. And that is, could you create like these small focus groups with your biggest fans? Because typically you know who your biggest fans are on your different, on your different channels, right? Um, could you ask them to create, uh, uh, you know, um, could you ask them to um, participate in a small like focus group like twice a year over Zoom and just ask them basic customer questions. What's keeping you up at night? What's topical for you right now? What are your biggest challenges? Um, what kind of content do you want to see from us? You know, just basic stuff like that. You might be surprised at how much that uncovers. And now with Zoom and technology like that, and the fact that a lot of us are stuck at home still, like that's a little bit more feasible than it was, you know, three, four, five years ago. And I think customers might be more open to it too. So just some ideas on how you can get a better feel for what your audience actually wants and how they can drive better content. And then finally, um, I think it makes sense to actually understand, have a pretty good understanding of what's happening on the internet each day. Because, you know, as most of us know that have worked in social media marketing for any given time, like you're not gone are the days when you're competing against your customer, your co competitors on social media, right? On the internet, you're competing against, um, you're competing against everybody for attention, right? It's the attention economy. So not only are you competing against competitors, you're competing against, well, the president of the United States, um, the governor of Minnesota, um, sports teams, um, your friends, your family, you're competing for attention against everyone. So that means, I think, you, one of the factors is you need to have a better handle on what's going on on the internet in a given day because that can inform content. So case in point, these memes that bubble up every once in a while, right? And, and this was a meme, I'm sure most of you saw this early in the year, but it's a meme that bubbled up from that tweet on the lower right-hand corner there back in November, I think it was, of 2020. And by the time it had, it had kind of circled through Twitter a little bit, it bubbled up through Reddit, it uh, was in a spot where brands were starting to jump in on it and uh, like McUltra and Starbucks and, you know, tell us your favorite Starbucks drink without telling us your favorite Starbucks drink. And I know these might seem lame a little bit, but at the same time, it, it, people like to participate in these things. That's why TikTok's so popular right now, right? Everyone likes to do these challenges. They like to do the hashtag challenges. People like to participate in these little memes. And if you can find out a way to make it relevant to your brand, um, it, makes, it makes you seem a little more relevant. So are they the most important pieces of content in your, in your toolbox? No, but it's just that little piece of like understanding what's going on on the internet on any given day can help, might inspire a piece of content that's gonna, that's gonna insert you in the conversation a little bit more. So how can you discover you know, what's trending on a daily basis? I know that's a big job and it's like, how am I get, I'm not gonna be able to add this to my, my list. Um, I got too much stuff going on. Well, I think there's a way to do this within a few minutes a day and that is you know, easy. Keep, keep tabs on TikTok. Like even if you're not a TikTok user, like I'm not a TikTok user, but I go on it every day just to see what's going on. Um, check out, again, Reddit, same thing. I know most people aren't Reddit users, doesn't mean you can't go on there and, and look at the, 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 the subreddits and, and, and things that are relevant to your, your business or your industry. You can quickly peruse what's happening on Twitter, that little right-hand bar, same thing on LinkedIn, LinkedIn News, and you always have Google Trends. So you have some easy tools available to you that can help you get a sense for what, just what's trending. What are people talking about on the internet today on a daily basis? So with social media, we always, come back to this notion of, uh, it seems like we have last number of years, this notion that good writing is kind of dead on, on social media, right? And the proof point here is that um, this study by this organization called Tidio said that 94% of people say they're attentive to grammar. However, when shown sentences that include seven common grammar mistakes, only 2.8% of people who said they're attentive spotted all those issues. So either they're surveying a very weird subset of society, or we're not nearly as good as good of writers and as readers as we thought we were because 
Um, that's a somewhat troubling stat, but I would say a lot of times on social media, it really depends on the audience. Um, specifically like TikTok, right? Like you see a lot of, um, you know, non-caps, uh, shorthand going on on TikTok. And this McDonald's tweets, I think sums it up perfectly. Um, here's a tweet. I mean, just look at the language in that tweet for a second. And then think about like, do you th really think in McDonald's style book, it says, yeah, sure. Don't capitalize, use shorthand, um, use you are instead of your. No, I'm pretty sure it doesn't say that, but McDonald's is trying to connect with a very young audience here. And in order to do that, sometimes they speak the language of their audience, which makes sense, right? So sometimes it's not always about like, hey, good writing's dead. No, good writing's not dead. It's just sometimes dependent on the audience. But I do think you can improve your social media writing by using a few simple um, and free, by the way, tools and processes. So I'll just share a few of those with you here um, for a minute, with a minute. So number one, Grammarly. If you're not using Grammarly already, um, I would highly suggest using that. It's easy, uh, especially if you're a Chrome user, you uh, install it and it, it'll catch a ton of stuff. And it, it, you know, for those of us that grew up as writers, like we kind of pride ourselves on being great proofreaders and getting grammar right and punctuation, all that stuff. But even with that, how fast we're going in today's day and age, you miss stuff. And Grammarly is great at catching um, a lot of the basics and then a lot of the stuff, um, you know, that you might not change. So highly recommend um, Grammarly, first and foremost. Hemingway Editor is another nice app that um, does a lot of things similar to Grammarly, but also the nice thing I like about them is they'll catch a little bit more, um, a little more detailed things. And they also give you the readability score, which I really like. So, and the reason that's important is because usually um, the statistics will show you that it makes sense if you're a brand to write at like a, they usually say between a seventh and eighth grade reading level, right? However, as we know, that's not always the case, right? So for anyone that has worked in employee communications, for example, for any given time, you know, when you're working with executives, like they're speaking at like a, at least a college level reading level, right? That's way too high for most consumer bases, unless you're talking to like physicians or maybe attorneys or something like that. If you're talking to a broader audience, usually the case is you want a, a seventh or eighth grade reading level, right? So the Hemingway editor is a nice, a nice tool just to spot that kind of stuff, but also spot a little bit of the same things you get with Grammarly. There's also, this is also this time boxing concept is one I kind of fell into. I was kind of doing this for years, but I didn't really know it had a term and apparently it's called time boxing, but I love this as a way to get more efficient as a writer because um, for anyone that creates um, social content on a regular basis, you know the biggest challenge you have most likely is like you have so much going on. How am I going to find one to two to three hours of uninterrupted time to create the content I need for you know next month or next week or whatever the case may be, right? Like it's hard to find uninterrupted time in your schedules. We're all so busy. But time boxing says, okay, here's what you do. You block your calendar. Let's say you want, you have to create content for October coming up for a client and you want to do it on Thursday, right? You block your calendar from eight to 10. You find a productive part of the day where you're most productive for writing eight to 10, block that time on your calendar and then devote that completely to writing social content for October. So that does two things. A, it blocks your calendar, which is very important to start, but B, it gives you a deadline. Right? It says, I'm going to try to create all that content for October in that two hour chunk. And I've kind of used that before I knew it was called time boxing informally for years. And it's been a huge help for me in terms of, um, you know, putting you on deadline and giving you undistracted um, time to develop content. Because again, that's the, the biggest challenge I would think for many of us is we're just so distracted by so many things. And you just got to turn the phone off, block your calendar, no meetings, and just focus on content. So that's a nice, a nice process maybe to try out. Answer the Public is, is a cool site um, that you can enter um, certain keywords into or phrases around your brand and it will give you these little wheels um, and word cloud type things full of prepositions and search phrases that people have used around that keyword or phrase that you put in. So this is great for um, generating new content ideas, right? Like I'm interested in creating more content that my customers care about, like we talked about earlier. How am I gonna do that? Answer the public, like start there. That's a great place to start because it's curating all these Google searches that incomplete and complete Google searches that people have done and telling you, well, here's what, here's what people are looking for or here's what they're searching for. Um, that can give you great insight into uh, kind of topics and angles that you might not have considered otherwise. So I found this to be a pretty helpful tool too. 
Cold Schedule has a great headline analyzer tool, I think, um, that is really wonderful in terms of really punching up your headlines. We'll talk a little bit about headlines in a little bit, but um, you know, headlines are so important in terms of digital content, social content, web content, and e-newsletter content across the board, right? So, and especially for um, if you're you know, a younger professional, like I remember when I was under the age of 30, like I, I just wasn't the best writer and I certainly wasn't a great headline writer. It just takes time and practice, you know? And this is a nice tool that allows you to get better at that really quickly because it'll, you know, it's looking at, you can see here on the graphic, it's, it's going to look at power words, emotional words, uncommon words, which will help you punch it up a little bit. It looks at, you know, uh, length. It looks at uh, complex phrases you can see there. So like, it just gives you a pretty complete picture of your headline and, and, and what, and ideas on how you can um, improve it. So this, I like this tool a lot too. And then finally, Feedly is a great tool that I've used for years for those of you that are a little bit older, um, like I am. Um, you remember Google Reader, which used to be the way we curated blog content um, on the web and figuring out what we want to read, whoops, on any given day. And um, when that sunsetted years ago, I moved to Feedly, which has been a great move because they've been an excellent tool. You can see on the left there, that's how I, how I aggregate my content is, you know, must reads, PR, social media reads, tools, case studies, facts and figures. This gives me an easy way to scan what people are writing about in our industry within, you know, 15, 20 minutes each day. So right now I'm doing this, this is all around PR and social media content, but I've done this, I have buckets for clients at some points too where it, it gives you a chance to look into like, what are the media writing about your client? Um, what are the topics they're covering? And that's a nice tool that hits on that basic question I was asking before. Do you know what's going on today, basically? So that's not as much as let's go, what's going on on the internet, but like what's going on with your customers, right? What are the topics that are impacting them? If you know that, you can design more content that gets at to solving their problems and helping them, which ideally with social media content is what you want, is a big part of what you want to do. So Feedly is a great tool for organizing your blog and media content on one site. I like that a lot. So I'll wrap up the social section by talking about a, a common challenge that we all probably had to face at one point or another with our clients or our companies. And that is this pressure from people to, um, you know, we need to get something up on social media. Like how many times have we heard that over the last number of years, right? Uh, we need to get it up on Facebook. We need to get this out on Twitter. Um, let's get it out on Instagram. Yeah, we get it. But let's be real. We're posting way too much content in 2021. We're all in a big rush, right? And Salesforce, as much as I love them, they do a great job in many areas with their social media content. But um, whoops, um, in general, they, uh, they, they publish a lot. So I'm checking to add people here when they come in. And you can see here in June, they published 282 tweets and 124 Facebook posts in June alone. I mean, that's, that's a crazy amount of content. There's not many companies um, on the planet that can produce that much content, reasonably speaking. Um, so I would argue instead, we need to slow down really and focus on best practices and stop trying to win the volume race because it's not a volume race anymore for the most part with, so with social media content. Um, it's just not. So it, I think it pays to slow down and really focus on creating the best content we can. And I think that starts with a few simple best practices. Number one, um, this kind of learn more crutch that we've leaned on for many years is just not simply good enough anymore. Um, we've probably all used this crutch in the past. Uh, we've certainly all seen it on social media. But if you're trying to drive traffic um, to your website through a social media post, um, a lot of people will end their post with learn more colon link, right? Like that's been pretty common or check it, check this out link, right? That's lazy writing. Like that's not going to get it done in 2021. Um, so Salesforce and GE here, I think are good examples of brands that do do a pretty good job of teasing their content that GE posts on the right. It's not sexy, but it's teasing it effectively, right? How this GE gas power plant in Schenectady, New York got its mojo back with lean management link. Right? Not check this out, not learn more. Like they teased it. The how this right at the beginning was their, was their key phrase. So there's some easy ways you can, you can work to tease content, but we, we need to do a better job of teasing content instead of just relying on the crutches that we've relied on for years. Number two, I think writing in the language of the platform is very important. Um, John Deere is a great example of this. John Deere, you would not think of John Deere 
the conservative brand they are as like this innovator in terms of Twitter. But man, go look at their Twitter sometimes. Like they do a great job on Twitter. Of, they don't always tweet things like this, but, but and, you know, they'll work them in enough where like that one on the bottom is perfect. I wonder if anyone, I wonder if I have anything green to wear, you know, said Noah John, dear employee ever. Like that's perfect, right? Because they're, they're writing in the language of the platform. It's not like some salesy post. It's not promoting anything. It's not uh, very stiff and corporate-y. It's writing in the language of the platform. It's how people talk on Twitter, right? Because again, they're competing with everyone. They're not competing with um, uh, just Toro. They're competing with everyone now for attention. So they're writing in the language of the platform. Or Boeing, there's another big, um, you know, B2B, uh, what you would think might be boring brand. Um, but they're on, they're on Instagram and they're speaking in the language of the platform too, using emojis. Now, again, I know that's not super sexy, but it's speaking in the language of the platform. Number three, um, and I know this sounds like a pretty basic one too, but I've seen it enough times where I thought it bared repeating here was this notion that your copy shouldn't, the, the copy in your text should not, should complement and not repeat the visual. So I see this a lot of times where there'll be copy in the text portion of an Instagram post or a Facebook post. And it says this exact same thing is what we see in the visual. And like, why would you, that's valuable real estate. Why would you use your text area of your post to copy, uh, uh, copy that's already in the visual, right? So Venmo is a good example of a brand that really does this well, where they're using user-generated content as the visual, right? You can see on the left of each of these posts. And they could copy that in the copy, right? Just to make sure you see it. But, but instead, they, they riff off it, right? And they play off it. They complement. And actually, the one on the right is a perfect example of not only this best practice, but the one I just mentioned in terms of writing in the language of the platform, because the text is simply the 100 emoji. Perfect, right? So make sure you're not doubling up on the text in your in your in your in the text of your post and what's in the visual. I think sometimes we, we forget that a simple question can go a long ways with our with our social communities. Um, the Carolina Panthers are a great example of this. I know professional sports teams have a big leg up on brands because they have a very passionate fan base, but hey, a lot of brands have passionate fan bases too. And chances are your brand probably has passionate fans that follow them on social media. So you know, could you just work a simple question into the equation every once in a while? Like this simple question of, they've, they, had, they had a series of these actually in June and July, right before the season opened, where they, they'd throw out these simple questions. And this one, you know, how many Panthers jerseys do you own? I know that seems really simple, but like in the NFL world, like that's, I mean, I'm a Vikings fan. Like that's a, that's a pretty good question because most NFL fans do have multiple jerseys. And there's sometimes there's a story behind those jerseys. So people want to talk about it. So like, this was really interesting because in the comments on the right there, you could see you go through people had multiple jerseys and sometimes they had an interesting story about that. So people want to talk about it. So what are the questions that you could ask your customers that can get them talking, right? Every brand's got one. Every brand's got multiple questions most likely. So thinking about those, um, I think is a, is a nice way in terms of developing content that will, that will get results. And then finally, when in doubt, just be useful. I feel like in social media content, we've gotten so far away from where it started, which was social media marketing, you know, seven to 10 years ago, you know, it was about being useful. It was about being helpful. It was about educating our customers. And we were, we were starting to think about sales and leads and all that stuff, but we weren't there because we were just having so much fun with this because it was working. It's what customers wanted. They still want that stuff we as brands just got so far away from that and so focused on leads and sales and all that stuff that we forgot that what most brands want, what most customers want on social media is just they either want their problem solved or they want to be entertained, basically, one of the two. And entertaining is kind of hard for most brands, so solving their problems and just being useful can go a long ways. Slack does a wonderful job of this. Now, Slack is, again, one of those apps, platforms who they can just go out there and promote themselves all day long like anyone else does. but a lot of their content focuses on education, like how to use the platform more efficiently, hidden features in the platform, ways to use the platform differently. Like that's being useful and that's super smart. So I would encourage you to maybe think about how you can be more useful in your content to your customers versus always selling them. And then if that doesn't work, just try to be stake them. And I say that justfully. Um, if you remember late last year, stake them, um, kind of turned social media marketing on its head and had this um, 
um, this basically tweet, um, and they started talking about all, all sorts of topics on the internet, including politics and and uh, racial injustice and all sorts of things that you would never think a brand like Steakham would talk about, but there they were. Um, but again, it kind of gets back to that last point, um, being useful, educating your customers can go a long ways. Um, Steakham just ha happens to be one of those um, rare brands that, that just took it to the next level. All right, so that kind of wraps up uh, social media, the social media section. I want to spend a little time talking about, um, you know, the web and what we can do to kind of spark um, more effective web copy. Um, and I know this is going to start like, sound like a broken record because we just talked about this before with social, but it, I, I do think it starts with the stats and looking at your statistics. I know a lot of people are looking at those again, but it bears repeating. Are you looking at your statistics? Are you looking at Google Analytics on a regular basis to find out some of the basics. And I think it starts with, do you know your audience on your website? Who's going to your website? Who's visiting that? So in this example, I really want to use a client example to make it probably a little more relevant, but you know, NDAs as they are, I can't, I can't really use any client data. So I thought I'd just use data from my website um, and show you that just is the same lessons, just, it's just my site. But um, if I start with the stats on my site and I look at my stats every week, um, when I think about my audience on my site, it's pretty clear, as you can see here, this is the data for um, 2021. It's pretty clear to me right here who my audience is on my website. It's 44 and younger, right? Because look at the dividing line. Like it's 44 and younger above and 45 and below. below. And it's not even close. It's 70% 44 and younger. And then what, 25% um, 45 and older. So, well, how does that make a difference for me? Well, it tells me, it tells me the, the tone I should be writing in to a younger audience. It tells me the kinds of content I should be writing to. So with my blog content, for example, I, I, I will be writing probably more, um, you know, mid-level, junior mid-level content versus I'm not writing for a VP necessarily. They're not visiting my site with regularity. Whereas like manager level people, specialist level people, even director level people probably are. So what's impacting them? That's what I'm trying to write about. So that's an example of like, do you know your audience? Who is your audience? And then how can you write to them more effectively? Do you also know the, you know, the, the top pages on your site in the last month, in the last year, in the last you know, two years? Again, here's an example of from my site from this year. Um, and the one I want to call it here is at number four. Um, it's a coffee post I usually write. It's where I talk about the people I went off coffee with in the new year. For those that know me, you know I've written that post for the last number of years now, and it's a lot of fun for me. Um, it's kind of a way to hold myself accountable for all these coffee meetups I do. But it's, I noticed that that post early on when I wrote the first one, I'd say maybe five years ago, is that it was instantly popular. And to me, the learning was people still like these list posts, right? Like people give the list posts a lot of crap, and they're not really working, and those aren't really popular anymore. But well, at least for me, they have been. So, okay, I'm going to keep doing that. It's working. And again, this year, look at it. I've been writing this for five years now. And this one, again, is my basically my top individual post so far of the year. So guess what? I'm going to write it again next year, too. So what can you learn? What are the learnings you can take from those top pages on your site and how regularly you're looking at those? And then finally, um, referral traffic. Do you know how people are getting to your site? So again, here's, here's my data for 2021. As I look at this, um, what pops out to me and what has continued to pop out to me for years has been um, how high organic search is. And that's not really that surprising for my site because I add, you know, I've been adding two blog posts to my site for every week for the last 12 years. Like I have a lot of content out there now. And as a result, organic search uh, keeps churning, right? And my, my search traffic goes up. So if, you know, if I would have looked at this eight years ago, this looks a little bit different. Social is a little higher, organic reach is a little lower, but when I've had my site up and running for 12 years, um, as I'm guessing most of your brand sites are the same way, organic search is usually pretty high. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you, <clears throat> obviously, you should be writing content based on how people are finding your brand. So it's essentially, like when was the last time you did an SEO audit? Like, do you know why, what people are searching for? So again, I go back to that answer the public tool. Like maybe you start there, like do an SEO audit, use tools like that, maybe SEO Moz. Um, and, you know, SEO audit is a whole separate webinar probably, but um, discovering how people are getting your site and then writing content to address those needs, that's a huge deal in terms of developing 
content that makes sense. So after you've kind of learned the basics um, in terms of your stats, um, I think it's time to look at other basics in terms of looking to develop copy that matches search intents. A little bit of what I was just talking about there a second ago and, 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 and the four categories of search intent, which are navigational, informational, commercial investigation, and transactional. So <clears throat> we use Delta as an example here. With the um, informational, it would be um, you know, something like who founded um, Delta Airlines, so inf inf information-based. Navigational is like they want to come straight to your site. They have a definite reason um, to go to your site. That was my direct traffic on my site. So um, someone would search for Delta Airlines. <clears throat> commercial investigation, they have a, it's transactional, right? They want to buy right now. So we buy Delta tickets to Mexico. And then um, <clears throat> you know, commercial uh, investigation would be like that research phase, right? So it's, that's a big B2B one. Like in this case for Delta, it would be like best airline for flying to Mexico. But in general, that's the, the big research phase for people. Um, so, you know, writing web copy that resonates, I think first you start with your purpose, right? Like what's the objective of your site? Are you trying to, are you trying to sell? Is it an e-commerce site? Are you trying to drive leads? Is it a B2B site? Um, maybe you're trying to build community. Like starting with your purpose is a good first step, but then also understanding that target audience. So I go back to the stats again. Um, who's coming to your site? What are their demographics? Where are they from? How old are they? What are their interests and what kind of problems are they trying to solve? Like what are their, what are their, what are their searches, right? What are they searching for? How are they getting to your site? Um, and you, you answer some of those basic questions and you'll be able to write your, your web. First of all, your organic search traffic on your website should go way up and uh, you should be able to write more, much more effective content. That's going to, uh, like, that's going to resonate with your audiences. So a few best practices before we get off um, the web copy. Um, I think using words and language your customers use is always important. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see marketers uh, make is <clears throat> they're not they're speaking their language, not their customer's language, right? So that has two big benefits. Number one, you'll build trust and connection with those customers because you're, you're speaking their language, obviously. But number two, you're going to optimize your content for search by using that language that they're, they're using in searches. So it's a, it's a no-brainer for a lot of reasons, but yet I still see a lot of brands using their lingo internal terms, things of that nature, right? Like your customers talk, like that's the biggest key. Um, you wanna also write content that's easily scannable and um, easy to read very quickly. So I know that um, is stated many times, but I thought it bared repeating using bullets, number lists, shorter sentences. The ideal length is more, no more than 20 words per sentences, five sentence per paragraph. You wanna keep things pretty short, really short. This isn't 1995 you know, anymore. Like you got to keep things really short, even shorter than you probably think when it comes to your web copy. And then you also want to front load information. So a lot of us kind of went through J school, right? And we learned about the inverted pyramid model when it comes to writing like a press release or news. Well, that applies to the web too. You want to start with the important content up front um, and, and make sure you hit your audience hard and then provide details later. Um, but make sure you hit them with the headline, um, hit them with that lead, and then, and then get to the rest a little later. Um, you always want to use an active voice. Um, you want to make sure you're using the right pronouns too, right? The customer is you, the company is we. Um, and I see a lot of I see a lot of we's when I look at some corporate websites. When really you're supposed to be talking to your customers, so using more of those you's is vitally important. And then uh, using you know very clear headlines and subheads. Again, that scannable content is huge. So make sure you're breaking up those. If you do have longer copy blocks. Make sure you're trying to break those up as much as possible, those clear subheads and, and, and things of that nature. Um, finally, you want to keep it simple. Um, again, that seventh and eighth grade reading level, um, you want to avoid jargon, um, use, those short and use those shorter sentences. And then, and then finally, you want to, you, you're ultimately there to encourage readers to act. So, you know, make sure you're using those call to actions and make sure they're stated very clearly in your copy and then make sure to back them up. So, not only make the call to action, but Back it up, back it up with proof points like success stories. Um, you know, maybe it's original research data, testimonials, what have you. But um, those proof points can say a lot because they're confirming what people want to do already. So that's a little bit about the web. Um, I thought some sites to learn from here that I thought are nice. Um, the banking industry actually is a, does a pretty good job of talking directly to customers. Um, at least a lot of the sites, Bank of America, Wells Fargo is pretty good here. Um, 
But Bank of America in particular, they're talking directly to their customers. They're using a lot more you and less we. Like they got that nailed, which, you know, banking industry has got a lot of flaws, but the way they organize their websites and, um, and uh, the copy they have in the websites and how they talk to their customers, perfect job there. Um, whereas Boeing, on the other hand, again, Boeing, I, I have two Boeing references in here, but big B2B brand, you might think they're a little more staid, but their website, again, keeping it simple. They're using big splashy visuals and then with nice little subheads with a learn, now I just ripped on learn more, but they're using the learn more in web copy. So maybe that's allowable, I guess, but keeping it very simple is my point, is my point in that case, right? And they have easy to scan subheads. So if you look at their homepage, you can just scan right down there and there's just not a lot of copy on that homepage. And I think that's a lot of what users are looking for in a website in 2021. So just a couple examples of brands that I think are getting the website website game uh, nailed, nailed up. Let's wrap by talking a little bit about e-newsletter copy. Um, and I want to start this one with kind of just an informal quiz. And I don't, I don't want you to answer this. I don't, have a, I don't have a quiz set up here. Just kind of something to think about. But um, if you think about these three subject lines, you know, which piques your interest the most? Check out this surprise. These are actual headlines from my email inbox, by the way. Check out the surprise. Number two, if you want to rank higher in search. Or number three, ever get writer's block? So I would say of those three, the one that piques my interest the most probably would be number two, right? Because number one is just entirely too vague, right? Check out this surprise. We just talked about not using checkout language before, um, but I would argue that's too vague. And number three is, you know, it's always nice to use a question in a headline, right? Or subject line. That's the good, good intent there. But the problem with that one is it's a yes, no question. So you usually want to try to avoid yes, no questions, just because if the answer is no, like, okay, we're not to read, I don't have to read that. Whereas if they made it a little more um, open-ended, it opens, you know, it, it, you're going to increase those open rates, right? So that's why that second one's just a little intriguing, right? If you want to rank higher in search, dot, 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 like, perfect. It's short, it's sweet, it's intriguing. Like, yes, I would like to rank higher in search. I'd like you to show me how to do that. I assume you're going to do that. And it'll encourage those open rates. So. Um, just a quick, a quick start here, but why, sub, why are subject lines so important? Well, 35% of email recipients open email based on the subject line alone, according to one stat. And I would argue that that seems a little low to me, but, um, but a huge percentage of people are opening just based on the subject line alone. Conversely, 69% of people report email spam based on the subject line alone. So subject line, super important, right? And, and that's kind of my first tip for your newsletter headline is it really is all about the subject line. Get really, really tight and really good at writing those subject lines. And that's why I talked about that, that co-schedule headline analyzer before. It's all about subject line. So again, these are um, actual headlines from a newsletter that I subscribe to called Benefits Pro and Newsroom. Um, I have one client in the health benefits space. So I, this is one of the magazines we pitch. And, um, and it's, a, it's a news media outlet, I get it. but um, they do a really nice job with their headline writing, right? So you can see most of these headlines, one key is like keeping your headlines under 50 characters or less or fewer. And they're pretty close on all these, right? 55, 38, 42, 59, 46, really close. And you can see the headlines themselves are really good, right? Five cost control levers for health plans. Okay, that's, that's got me interested, right? Uh, PTO or for vaccinations, are employees on board? Right, that's not a yes, no question necessarily, right? It's like an intriguing question. So, Benefits Pro does a really nice job with their subject lines, and um, and that's how you roll people. And you got to get people to open the newsletter before they can engage with the content, right? So it's all about the subject lines. On uh, number two, you want to make sure you're keeping your newsletter, um, you know, fairly short, short and scannable, right? So the example I use here is, uh, and just like web copy, uh, the example I use here is Next Draft. So this is uh, this guy by the name of Dave Pell. Um, organizes and sends out this daily email called Next Draft. And it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful email for kind of keeping tabs on like what's going on around the world, basically. Um, it leans pretty left politically, so I, I don't love the, the political nature. Sometimes it's a little much for me personally. But the point is, the newsletter is organized in a very wonderful way where I can just scan down. It's almost like the skim, for those of you that probably maybe um, subscribe to the skim. But you can scan down on any given day. He's got 10 items. Um, you can read his little synopsis, which are usually really funny, too. And then it's got the link for more information. Perfect. That's what I want, right? I want to scan and link, scan and link, scan and link. 
Um, and then on Fridays, you'll have these little sections, which is even more concise, where I'll have, you know, a sentence or two about these, you know, fun things on Fridays designed to make you feel a little bit better um, with the link. Perfect. Keep it short and scannable. By the way, if you're not subscribed to this newsletter, really great. Number three, make it super easy to read. So very similar to number two, but make it, you know, again, super easy to read in a very short amount of time. People don't have a lot of time to read your newsletter. They're only going to spend a couple of minutes at most. And the Axios newsletter locally here in the Twin Cities, I know they have these around the country too, but is a wonderful example. <clears throat> Each newsletter is organized with, um, you know, a, a very short intro and then like I think they have like six items every day six or seven items with these numbers and then each number like this one is about the state fair a few weeks ago has these subheads and the subheads are like one sentence max maybe two super easy to scan super easy to read I can read the whole thing in like five minutes and it's wonderful right so make it as easy as possible for people to read and as fast as possible for them to read um, so again shorter the better and um, even shorter than you might think. And then finally, I, I think sometimes newsletters have a, have a tendency, as marketers, when they send newsletters out, they have a tendency to focus again, just like social content a little bit, focus too much on selling, even though I know we need to sell, I need to, we, we need to get our call to actions in there. But I think there needs to be probably more of a focus on education and then selling, right? So we need call to actions in there, but we also need to have a pretty big focus on education. And Trunk Club is a nice example of this. They um, provide a lot of information on, um, you know, how to dress. And as a guy, I, I subscribed to, I did subscribe to Trunk Club at one point, so I still get their emails, but I, I struggle with that, right? So I do need ideas. So most, most of the time their emails are, are nothing more than ideas for how I should dress, you know, layer like a pro, uh, trends, tips, and outfit ideas, like perfect, that's what I want. And that's what they give to me. Now they certainly have calls to action in there embedded in the newsletter, but they're smaller. The focus is on the education. So I would argue, like, if you want to make yourself relevant as a brand in 2021, um, from almost all of these buckets that we've talked about today, social, web, and e-newsletters, this, this, this concept of focusing on uh, useful content or education, you're hearing that come through loud and clear. But that's a really key tenant that if you just do that alone, if you grab that alone from this webinar today, you're, you're going to be, you're probably going to have a pretty, like, pretty big leg up on your competitors and, um, and other brands out there. So that's it. I know we got a few uh, moments left. Um, if you want to subscribe to my e-newsletter, like I said, you can do that at erichanson.com. Um, if you have a project that you need help with, you can reach out to me at eric, eric at eric I'd love to love to chat. And if you have feedback for me on this presentation, I'd love to hear it. Uh, send me a note. Um, my next webinar, I'm hoping to do these actually on a quarterly basis. I'm not going to do a ton of them a year, but maybe four a year. And my next webinar, I believe uh, I'm going to hold in November, and it's going to focus on networking in a post-pandemic world. So if you're interested in, in signing up for that, um, look for information on that in my e-newsletter or on my site soon. Um, with that, I think I'll unmute everyone and um, maybe open it up for questions since we have about nine minutes here. So if anyone has any questions, um, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Going once, going twice. I don't have a question, Eric, but I just want to say thank you. Um, at Winona State, we've really been taking um, social media to a new level. And I've been following you for many years. And um, I even have my student worker on the call today, too. So thanks for the tips and tricks of the trade. And hopefully, we'll be able to take some of those things and put them to use. You bet. Go Warriors. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Tracy. Yeah, you too. Okay, if that's, um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to give it a going once, going twice, going three times. Um, I'm going to end the presentation. Again, I'd love to hear from you if you want to send me a note, eric at erichanson.com. Otherwise, visit my website for uh, other information that I talked about before. And uh, thanks for being here. It's good to see everyone.